Oh, look at this. Intruder alert. Intruder alert. I'm sorry, I'm just acknowledging the arrival of uh, media in the media room, which is, uh, I think, speaks to why we're here today. Um, I want to acknowledge, of course, that we are on the traditional territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, and I'm joined. Uh, by Dr. Bonnie Henry, a provincial health officer, Minister Adrian Dix, Minister of Health, and Ravi Kalon, the Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation. And today is an exciting day, not just because we have representatives from the media in person, but it's also uh, a little over a month ago that uh, the four of us gathered to announce that we were moving gradually to a return to normal here in British Columbia. And our, our project was based on science, it was grounded in data, and it was focused on making sure that we were laying out a roadmap for recovery so that all British Columbians could see a path forward for themselves, for their businesses, for their communities. And British Columbians have stepped up every step of the way during this pandemic. We have had extraordinary results in British Columbia relative to other jurisdictions in Canada, rather relative to other jurisdictions of our size internationally. And that is a testament to the good work of the Public Health Office, the Center for Disease Control, and all of the healthcare representatives, whether they are on the front lines, whether they're doing research, whether they are providing the counsel and advice based on the data that we've seen, not just here, not just across the country, but internationally. British Columbians have been so well served, so well served by our public health institutions. And I just want to take a moment to reflect on that. And, not to get overly flowery, but Dr. Henry doesn't go for that sort of thing, but her and her team have led us through this, and I am so proud, so proud to be a British Columbian based on how all of us have responded over the past 16 months. Vaccination rates have continued to go up, uh, again, relative to other jurisdictions, extraordinarily well. Cases are dropping. Today's, uh, I'm, am I jumping the gun on this? 29 cases in British Columbia today seven in Fraser Health, seven in Fraser Health. And uh, the, these outcomes are a direct res result of the efforts that all of us have made as British Columbians to take a global pandemic as seriously as we should, follow the direction and guidance of public health officials, and take care of each other, take care of our neighbors, take care of businesses in our community. So today, I'm happy to announce that on July 1st, we will begin step three of our restart plan. After the longest public emergency in Canadian history, I believe it's safe to take the next step forward. That means we can go and cheer for our kids at the soccer game, in the arena, in the gymnasium. We can go to a friend's place for dinner. We can plan that wedding. We can go to the theater. We can go to a concert. We can engage again in what makes life so important. That's the interaction of people together to get a full flavor of the, the, the benefits and bounty of British Columbia and to share with each other the, 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 uh, the blessings of being British Columbians, whether we be athletes, whether we be actors, whether we be performers, getting back to a live environment. Here comes more media. They're coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, this is a reminder to all of us that we have been through an extraordinary time, but yet the journey is not over. Dr. Henry will be giving us some guidance and direction on how we go through uh, into step three and what that means for all of the, the issues that we want to touch. We talked about this six weeks ago. We laid out the plan. Minister Callon will be talking about how businesses will be reacting to this, but um, I spoke to Dr. Henry before we came out. Of course, we want people to plan their trips uh, as they come to British Columbia. We welcome uh, Canadians back to BC, provided you've had those two vaccinations, provided that you check before you arrive to make sure that there aren't local restrictions in place, to ensure that Indigenous communities have a clear understanding of how many people are coming to their territory and what the consequences will be. But we also have to keep following the guidelines and the recommendations that Dr. Henry will lay out for us in a few moments. And we have to do what's most important for ourselves, for our families and our communities. If you have not yet registered to vac get yourself vaccinated, do so immediately. If you have not yet had that second shot, get it as quickly as you can. This has been an extraordinary time for all of us. And I know that there's still some challenging times ahead. We are in the midst of the hottest week British Columbians have ever experienced. 
And there are consequences to that, disastrous consequences for families and for communities. But again, how we get through this extraordinary time is by hanging together, checking up on those people we know might be at risk, making sure we have cold compresses in the fridge or, or, or we're staying in the coolest part of our homes and making sure that we're taking steps to get through this heat wave and then preparing for the challenges that uh, await us in a host, whole host of other ways whether it be the opioid crisis, whether it be the climate crisis, whether it be all of the challenges in our lives, all of the challenges that we know we need to face head on together. Let's take a moment today to reflect on where we've been and celebrate the opportunities that we have ahead of us as individuals, as families, and as communities to put COVID-19 behind us from a pandemic to a communicable disease, which means keep washing or cleaning those hands. I'm going to be wearing a mask if I'm in a, with a group of people that I do not know. If I'm on a bus, if I'm on a ferry, if I'm on an airplane. These are recommendations now, not uh, uh, directives. But those recommendations are there for a reason. And Dr. Henry will lay out some of those right now again uh, to the media. Welcome back. Uh, to British Columbians, thank you for thinking about each other over the past 16 months. Let's keep doing that through this challenging week and throughout the summer as we get ready to go to stage four uh, come Labor Day. Thank you very much and good afternoon. And it is indeed um, a great uh, um, announcement today that we are ready to um, bring us back together. Let me just get this together. So as yesterday's modeling presentation showed us, we are making very encouraging positive progress in, co in our COVID-19 pandemic response here in BC. And we're all dealing with uh, our own pandemic across the country and across the globe. And here in BC, we've done an amazing job at getting people protected through immunization and ensuring that we're stopping the transmission of the virus. As a direct result of those measures, the number of people who are now immunized, we have seen a dramatic and sustained decline in new cases across the province. As well, we've seen a decline in hospitalizations and deaths. We are continuing our careful and gradual approach to bringing us back together. And during step one and two, we watched carefully, we monitored that data, and we are now ready to move on to the next stage. As we said, we over 78% of people aged 18 plus have their first dose now in British Columbia. And over a third of us have had a second dose too. Our COVID-19 case counts remain low and fewer people are in hospital or in ICU. And that are some of the important measures that allow us to move forward. I showed this slide yesterday when we talked about the data that allows us to take these next steps. And it really shows that vaccination, these safe and effective vaccines that we have in Canada and in BC have been a game changer. They are what allow us now to move on, to move on from the pandemic to living with COVID as one of those respiratory viruses in our lives and being able to get back to the things that we need to do in our lives, those important social connections. We will be continuing, of course, our vaccination efforts. We know that there are some pockets that have not yet had um, those high levels of dose one immunizations. And we're uh, across the province reaching out to people to make sure that it is easy for you to get your vaccine. We're cautiously moving forward. But I think the important principle that we have right now is that we no longer need to have orders and directives in place. And we can remove those and replace them with the guidance that allows us to live our lives as we move through this next, restrict, this next uh, step in the reopening. So that means targeted restrictions, restrictions and guidance that are effective and efficient, but allow us to support people to getting back to work, to getting back to the social interactions in our lives. And we've switching from the COVID safety plans that were very specific when we didn't know as much as we know now about this virus and how it's transmitted to communicable disease plans that um, bake in fundamental principles that prevent transmission of disease in all settings. We are lifting the provincial state of the emergency. Um, that, of course, will be Minister Farnworth's job very soon. But some of the provisions have now been rolled into um, the uh, regulations so that ticketing powers around certain aspects will still be maintained. I also want to make it clear 
that we are still in a public health emergency. There are still transmission of this virus globally. We still have to monitor and to take additional measures to follow closely what's happening with COVID-19. And the public health emergency will remain in place. So this is the summary of where we are now in step three. As of July 1st, many of the orders that are currently in place, as I said, will be rescinded. This is a very positive step as orders are only put in place when there's an urgent and critical need to do so. One of the most important one will be the lifting of the mandate or the orders under the Emergency Programs Act around mask wearing. That doesn't mean that mask wearing is not important. It certainly is and it will now be moving to our guidance on where we should be wearing masks and I'll talk a little bit more detail about that in a minute. The other aspects that we'll be looking at are increasing our ability to do personal gatherings. And so we will be lifting the orders on personal gatherings. We'll be looking at uh, increasing capacity around organized gatherings, both indoor and outdoor settings. And we'll be welcoming people from across the country, particularly people who've been immunized, to come and enjoy BC with us. Sports and activities will resume their normal activity levels and businesses will be changing as well. And finally, offices and workplaces will continue that gradual return to work. So let's talk about a few of the details. Our updated mask guidance in this step, mask wearing will be recommended in all indoor public spaces for all people 12 and over who are not yet fully immunized. So that means it is important for us to continue to wear masks in those indoor settings when we're around people that we don't know and where we not yet have been fully protected. Some people may also continue to choose to wear masks and that's okay. We need to remember that we all need to go on our own pace and there are some reasons why we may be feel more at risk or it may be important for us to continue to protect ourselves using masks. The face coverings order under the Emergency Programs Act will be lifted and we also do not recommend and there's no need for people to provide proof of vaccination. We know that most people in British Columbia are doing the right thing and we expect that will continue. The other, um, the next area around gatherings. So there's several different uh, types of gatherings that we have had restrictions on uh, in British Columbia and now is the time where we can start to lift those. First, the orders around personal gatherings. So that's the people you can have into your home or a, a vacation rental, for example. We want to lift those. We know that these are situations where these are people that we know. We uh, are removing the order because we know the risk. We know the vaccination status. We can invite people into our home based on our risk and the risk of those around us and our friends and family. So it is up to us to decide who we have in our home now. So this is the, the time where, yes, if your grandparents and aunties are immunized, they can come over and you can have that family gathering and hug the grandchildren if people are protected. But everybody needs to move at their own pace in this as well. We know that as we did before this pandemic, if somebody was undergoing medical treatments like cancer treatments, then we need to take those precautions still. And we may want to have smaller gatherings or do them outside so that we're not putting each other at risk. In terms of organized gatherings, we're going to re ease the restrictions. And again, it's the principles that outside is less risky than inside. So in indoor gatherings, up till now, it's been up to 50 people. As of July 1st, it'll be 50 people or 50% capacity, which is whichever is larger for that venue. So if your venue is one that holds a capacity of 60 people, then you can have 50. If it's a venue that has 500 people, then 50% capacity would be 250. And we'll need those communicable disease plans to make sure that we're minimizing the risks of people coming when they're sick and making sure they have space that they need. For outdoor gatherings, again, we have learned a lot. This virus does not transmit as well outside, particularly in the summer months. And we know that we can have larger gatherings together safely outside. 
So for outdoor gatherings, 5,000 people will be the limit. Below that, if your venue can hold up to 5,000 people, you can have 100% capacity. Above 5,000 people, the capacity will be 50% again, just to give us some time to adjust to having large numbers of people together. Indoor weddings, ceremonies and events, again, will be very similar to the indoor gatherings. Um, on the other hand, we know there's a different risk when we have outdoor events like fairs and festivals and even some of the uh, uh, large trade shows, and they can return to normal. These are events where people, what we are calling flow-through events, where people can move away from others and keep their distance. It's not like being seated right next to somebody or in an enclosed um, space. So we are returning to normal with communicable disease plans to make sure that we are again minimizing the risk using those basic principles. And finally, um, after all of the consultation that we've had the, the privilege of having with our, our faith leaders and faith communities across the province, I will be removing all of the PHO restrictions on religious worship services. And we'll be moving again to the guidance that we have created together to support faith communities to come back together without restrictions, making sure there's safety and plans for each of them to do this in a way that allows us to come together again safely. In terms of travel, as we said, we'll be welcoming people from other provinces, preferably vaccinated people. And the guidelines will be what we have said all along. Be respectful of those who you're visiting and recognize that you're bringing risk with you. And I, we know that as more people are coming into British Columbia, there are a chance that people will come with this virus. And they may come with different strains or variants of the virus. So we need to have some measures in place to, to be able to um, detect people. And we know we have a lab uh, strategy now where we will be testing everyone so we know exactly what strains are circulating. But plan ahead. Do a little bit of research, research before you arrive at your destination and respect those local travel advis advisories. Not every community has received two doses of vaccine for all of their members yet. And not every community is ready yet to receive visitors. But many, many are. In terms of workplaces, our, my office and the BC CDC and our public health teams have been working very closely with WorkSafe BC to assist employers to transition from the very specific COVID-19 safety plans to what we're calling communicable disease plans. They will focus on the appropriate pillars of hand washing or hand cleaning, um, hygiene in the environment, things like ventilation, and of course the most important, making sure that we have uh, the ability for people who are sick to stay away from others and to stay away from work. And there's a whole bunch of processes that are involved in that. We know that there are some, and we've identified this through this pandemic, there are some workplaces where the risk is higher and we are going to continue some of the restrictions that made a difference in terms of protecting workers in those workplaces. Um, and healthcare is a classic example, and some of the uh, the accommodations, or the common accommodations on farms and in some of our industrial work plants. So we'll be working with WorkSafe BC and those sectors to develop specific plans that can be used in those areas. But we also know that there are things like barriers, which will still be in place in many places to protect workers in retail, in, uh, in the grocery store. And as we transition over this period of time with more and more people protected and fewer people wearing masks, those barriers will still be important. Outbreaks will continue to be managed by our local public health teams, including, if, if required, closing down a business for a period of time to ensure that the outbreak doesn't spread. Some of the other uh, things that uh, have been restrictions in businesses, in restaurants, bars, and pubs, the table limits will no longer be in place. So we're removing most of the restrictions in restaurants and bars and pubs. And so you can determine how many people sit at a table. We're returning to normal liquor service hours. Um, but we still need to have some measures in place in these inside environments. So uh, for now, there's not going to be that socializing between tables and making sure we still have barriers in place where, it's imp where it protects people. 
Uh, we've been working with the nightclub sector, and as you know, they've been closed for um, since last summer when we knew there was uh, challenges with high risk uh, in a high risk environment. And so there will be some additional measures in place in, in the nightclubs that have been worked out with that sector, including some distancing or barriers between tables um, and so not socialising between tables. And finally, we've been working with the casino uh, sector as well, and I know they've been working hard on this since, uh, since uh, everything shut down last year, and uh, they have very strong plans for reopening on July 1st and include some um, restrictions on, and barriers in place in those settings. So that's the, the basics of where we're going right now. Our layers of protection look a little bit different, but the basics remain the same. And I think it's very important for all of us to respect that we're in different places and not everybody is ready to let um, things go uh, at the same pace. And that includes businesses and it includes some of the workplaces as well. But really the important things that we do for each other are to be immunized, to follow the guidelines. And so masks may be required in many facilities, in many stores, for example, um, on transit in the short term. We know that only 30% of adults in BC have received two doses of vaccine. So as that goes up over the next few uh, weeks, um, we may be seeing less people wearing masks. But right now, we still will expect most people to be wearing masks in those indoor settings when we're around other people. Staying home if you're sick remains critical. Checking before you travel. Respecting others' personal space and your personal space. Not everybody's ready to go back to those greetings. Um, not everybody's ready for a handshake right now. We've never been through something like this before as a, as a collective, as a society. So we need to be patient. It may be fist bumps and elbow bumps for a while yet for many people. It's always safer or less risky outdoors. And you need to consider other people's situations. And I've said this many times, we don't always know another person's story. So we need to continue to be compassionate and to understand when other people want us to take certain measures. And we'll never have to stop cleaning our hands. So this is a positive positive step forward for us all, but it's going to take us some time to adjust and to get there. We know that every time we make changes, there's questions and there's lots of concerns and there's lots of uh, questions that people have about every aspect of this. That's why we're giving a few days for people to start getting adjusted to some of the, the things that will come in place on July 1st. But we will be with you in public health, with WorkSafe BC, We'll be working with you to answer those questions so that we can all make this transition and get back to some of the important connections in our life that we have been missing. You can be also reassured that COVID-19 continues to be a primary focus of my office and public health leaders and our teams across the province. And this is important too. We will continue to follow every case to manage outbreaks and clusters and prevent transmission. And I've said this a few times too, we've supported over 147,000 of our friends and colleagues and community members across this province who've had COVID-19. And we will continue to do that to keep our numbers down and our risk down in our community so that we can move ahead safely with getting back to our lives. We are watching things closely and we will continue to. We have never been here before and it has been a long 18 months. Some people and some businesses will be moving more slowly and that's okay and we need to respect that. It is all of our responsibility to do this well and having been through this last 18 months, I know that we can do this too. And we can do it with kindness, with the compassion, the diligence and commitment that got us here and got us through this last 18 months. We're turning up the dial slowly but things are a lot brighter today. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ravi Kalon, BC's Minister for Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today uh, on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, it's an honor to be joining uh, Premier Horgan, Minister Dix and uh, of course uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry um, today. Step three of our restart plan is a major milestone. We can now resume more of the activities and events that we love to enjoy. This step gives workplaces and businesses more flexibility. It opens the door for more economic activity as we transition into the summer. We can take this step because people have been keeping themselves and their family members and their community safe. We know that getting vaccination is the best thing we can do right now. And I want to thank everyone uh, for stepping up and doing their part. Lifting the restrictions uh, will not be easy for everyone. Uh, it uh, will be uncomfortable for some. Please be kind and respectful of one another. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to speak about uh, what businesses can expect from these next steps. As we enter step three, employers will no longer be required to have COVID-19 safety plans. They will be transitioning to communicable disease prevention plans. WorkSafe BC has developed a communicable disease prevention guide this guide outlines the steps that employers must take to prevent transmission in the workplace. Key elements of the prevention include regular hand washing, regular cleaning of surfaces, staying home if you're sick, and of course, encouraging people to get vaccinated. This will be a big shift for everyone. Businesses have adapted through the pandemic, and this will be another transition for them. Each business will be doing this at their own pace. Please have patience and show kindness and understanding. In terms of some of the restrictions that will be lifting on July 1st, restaurants can remove group limits for indoor and outdoor dining. This means you can be with more family and friends at your favorite restaurant. Casinos and nightclubs will be open for the first time in 16 months. They will have the capacity limits and safety measures in place. We can now also safely welcome visitors from other provinces. This is great news for our tourism sector. When we can also get back to indoor fitness classes at regular capacity. Step three brings us closer to where we were before the pandemic. As we come out of the pandemic, the pace will be different for each of us. We need to be respectful and patient with each other. We need to be aware of each other's boundaries. We need to be kind to the people and the businesses who are working hard to reopen safely. Vaccination numbers continue to climb, but not all of us have the same level of comfort or protection right now. We need to be respectful of businesses that may continue to require masks. And we need to be respectful of others who may ask you to wear a mask around them. Nothing about this pandemic has been predictable. Businesses have needed to adapt under difficult circumstances. Patience and kindness will see us through the other side. As we enter step three, please continue to support your local businesses. Do some shopping. Have dinner with some friends at your favorite neighborhood restaurant. This is how we will help our local businesses and communities get through this. Thank you very much. And now I'll welcome uh, BC's Health Minister, Minister Dix. Thank you, Minister Kellogg, uh, Premier, Dr. Henry. Uh, uh, I think just a, a few words now about uh, where we are and uh, the things that lie ahead and a couple of reflections of where we've been. I think that uh, throughout our pandemic in BC, we've shown each other generosity, empathy, understanding, compassion, and kindness, and we have been tested. When our worries were great, our sorrows deep, and our patience thin, we drew upon these traits and in doing so, help make the days better and the future brighter for ourselves and for all of those around us. I cannot tell you how much gratitude I feel to the people who are the public health care system in BC, our health care workers, health care professionals, people who uh, are dispatched as paramedics, people who work in our emergency rooms and acute care and in long-term care and in community care. I think uh, their work throughout this period of anxiety has been exceptional. 
And I think we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Part of paying that debt of gratitude, it seems to me, is to continuing to get vaccinated. Tomorrow, I believe, tomorrow morning, uh, we'll have done our five millionth uh, vaccination in BC, administration of our five millionth vaccination. And that is going extraordinarily well, 78.3% as of yesterday evening of all those over 18, 77% of all those over 12, and 31.6% of adults have received their second dose, and 29.5% have received, of all those over 12 have received their second dose. We need to keep going. If you have not received your first dose, get registered and get vaccinated. And think of all those people, all of those people that we can be grateful to for their work during this health care emergency, during these two public health emergencies. I think it reflects the centra central role and the important role of public health care that we're, of course, in the midst right now of a heat wave that is profoundly affecting our communities. Heat waves are especially dangerous for all people with underlying medical conditions. And right now, in every acute care hospital, and in our ambulance system, which received 1,975 calls yesterday, an all-time record again, having broken all-time records from Saturday and from Friday. Our home support workers, those working in long-term care in the community, and families and friends are affected by this. And we need to, in these times, continue to understand in this period, in this particular moment, how much we count on the people who work in health care and how much we count on each other. I ask people, especially as we see this heat wave prolonged, to keep in touch with one another, not just phone, but check on the ones we love, especially those with underlying health conditions. This is, of course, a day to recognize and to a degree to celebrate, but it also tells us the ongoing challenges we face as we come out of this and continue to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and the public health emergency that is the overdose crisis. As we've heard from Premier Horgan, Dr. Henry and Minister Callan, the future is ours to shape. Everything is possible. After all we've been through, that statement, those possibilities of, are, of course, breathtaking. Everything is possible. And our efforts to stop the spread have made it so, as has our kindness, our calmness, our generosity to one another. There is soon to be much more that we can do to renew ourselves, our society, our economy, our relationships, and reconnect with people, places, and activities that we've missed for months and months. And as we continue to register for, book, and get our first and second doses, and as we continue to follow the guidance that keeps us healthy and saves lives, we'll each find our own comfort zone within that wondrous array of new possibilities. We'll each set our own safe course to our future. Thank you very much. I want to say one last thing. I want to express on behalf of, I think, a truly really grateful province to Dr. Bonnie Henry, but her whole team in public health and at the BCCDC. As those of you know, uh, we've been briefing here, in, mostly in Victoria, but around BC, since January of 2020 on the COVID-19 pandemic. And the person people have looked into in what have been really difficult times have been Dr. Henry, who works every day and who, as I've said, I think before, expresses the compassion she shows on this, at this podium in everything that she does. And I am so uh, appreciative of that. We won't be doing the regular briefings going forward. The rest of this week for members of the media will be providing written briefings through Friday. And next week, we'll have new ways to distribute in, in a timely way to media appropriate information about COVID-19. Now, Dr. Henry and I are still going to be around and still going to be available to you to answer questions. And obviously, with the events we deal with now, dealing with the very significant challenges that are going to face us in the next period, but also, I hope, the joys and the celebrations. But I wanted to say, uh, on my own behalf and on behalf of BC, a special thank you to Dr. Bonnie Henry for her all she's done up to now and all she's going to do to help us get through the remainder of the pandemic in the days and the weeks, the months. And yes, well, I won't say any more, the period to come. Thank you.
Well, thank you, uh, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Ravi, and thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, it has been an extraordinary time, and uh, I think uh, although we're continuing to struggle with a host of issues, I hope people will forgive us a little bit of levity today, uh, particularly on, on behalf of, of Dr. Henry, who, as Adrian so eloquently said, has been everywhere for all of us for what seems like an eternity, and, and we're also very grateful, and I know that she doesn't take this very well, so I'm going to stop now but uh, and invite uh, questions from uh, the media, maybe face to face. <laughs> or get on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Call in. Thank you, Premier. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow up. Today, we are going to go to the phone lines first. First question is from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Hello, oh, thank you. I'd like, I'm a little bit confused about this new mask um, guidance. First of all, as I understand it, masks protect others from being infected by the mask wearer. Um, and secondly, studies have shown that um, the, there is a lack of efficacy against variants with just one dose of vaccine and only 30% protected. So why invite the transmission of variants by removing the mask requirement? Yeah, I think there's a number of issues that you, you've talked about there. And yes, masks do protect others, but our risk goes down dramatically after two doses of vaccine. And that's why we're talking about the importance of continuing to wear masks in indoor public spaces when we uh, are not fully vaccinated. And that's important. But we also know um, that we have done a great job at decreasing transmission of the virus in this province. So we are not seeing widespread of any of the strains of the virus right now. So when transmission is low and immunization is high, even with a single dose of vaccine, our protection is high enough that we no longer need some of the restrictive measures. We have always had a series of layers of protection and we always know that the, the last layer of protection, our personal protective equipment, a mask, is the last layer of protection. And there are many other things that we do. Most important is having low rates of transmission in our communities. And when we put the mask mandate in place, it was because we were seeing widespread transmission in the community and we didn't know who was at risk and who wasn't. It was very difficult to tell and that's how we saw outbreaks in uh, workplaces and all kinds of places. But we're now at a point where we know where most of the cases are and we will continue to manage um, every single case as we have been doing. And right now, as you can see by the numbers of active cases, uh, most of the people who are developing the disease are known contacts of a case. So we're not out of the woods by any means and we are going to continue to have adequate surveillance in, um, all across the province and making sure we're following cases and following which strains of the virus people are being infected with. But we also know that when you have high rates of protection, particularly um, if we compare, for example, the UK and what we have here, we have very high rates of protection in younger people compared to what they have in the UK. So that level of protection reduces your risk dramatically, and I showed some of that data yesterday, and it means that your risk of, one, getting infected, and two, passing it on to somebody else goes down dramatically, regardless of what strain we're talking about. So yes, we're going to continue to watch, but right now we're in a place where we can start to get back together again. And that includes wearing masks in indoor public spaces um, for the next little while until we're fully protected. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I'd like to ask about um, the report today, the briefing to the Royal Society of Canada, talking about the fact uh, that a group of researchers believes that at least two-thirds of the deaths caused by COVID-19 outside of long-term case, uh, case counts and long-term care may have been missed and that, you know, up to 1,767 people died in BC above what would be expected um, according to this policy briefing. And they blame poor data collection and inadequate recognition of the impact of COVID-19 on low-income racialized communities. So. In light of that, is there anything that you or your office will do to collect data in a different way? 
So I think we need to take that um, review um, with a grain of salt because we have, as we've presented a number of times, we have an ongoing surveillance system where we do look at um, total deaths and deaths by cause here in British Columbia, and we've presented that a number of times. And very early on in this pandemic, uh, we had an arrangement with the coroner service. We worked together to make sure that uh, any sudden unexpected deaths in the community uh, were tested for COVID. So I don't agree with what that report has come out with, and I think there are variations that they have made assumptions between what happened in Ontario, for example, and what happened here. Undoubtedly, there are some deaths that we missed early on. Um, it's just a function of the testing capacity. But we also know from the work that we have done, the surveillance that we've had over the last 10 years that we continued through this pandemic, that the vast majority of deaths that we saw were related to COVID in older age groups and related to the overdose crises in younger age groups, and we've presented some of that data. As well, there are um, unexpected deaths in the community that are related, we believe, from the data that we've looked at at the BCCDC, more to people not seeking health services for other underlying conditions. So not directly related to COVID, but more related to people who didn't access hospital services when they needed to. And we've seen that in the emergency department data. We've seen that in hospitalization data uh, for th through that period of time. So this is absolutely something that we are continuing to monitor and change and to uh, try and understand. And you know, collecting data, uh, race-based data, is a different issue. And we have collected disaggregated data by uh, indigeneity from the very beginning, again, because we compelled the linking of uh, databases with uh, a partnership with the First Nations Health Authority and also a partnership we have with Métis Nation BC. So those data we have been following very carefully and we have a good understanding of how the pandemic has affected Indigenous peoples in BC. What we don't have is a case-based data collected by, by race. And, and that is not a question that we asked directly every single case from the very beginning. And we are absolutely working at and with our colleagues across the country to find other ways of understanding the impact on different communities. Because as you can imagine, when somebody has been diagnosed, particularly early on, uh, with uh, a new infectious disease, some of those questions are not that important in terms of us understanding how to react to the pandemic. They are absolutely important in helping to understand the inequities and the impacts on communities. And we have other ways of finding that information, including things like the surveys that we have done. So absolutely, we want to be able to more systematically understand the impact of the pandemic, but also the impact of the measures we took to manage the pandemic on all our communities in BC, and we are working on that. Next question is in the room. Okay, we'll go to Bender Sajjan next. Um, Dr. Henry, I just wanted to ask you, back on May 3rd, you said that large outdoor gatherings would not be possible uh, this year. Obviously, this is a big change from that. Um, do you think it's too late for some uh, festivals to get going? Maybe like Pride, is it too late for them? Do you regret saying that maybe this was not going to be possible? And just wanted some clarification when it comes to indoor seated venues, uh, the 50% capacity. Does that mean that people have to have physical distancing in place between tables or seats or groups of people? Yeah, so the second one first, what we what we are trying to do is get out of the prescription business and, and say what we expect is people have up to 50% capacity and use the entire space to be able to give people the, the space you need within the, uh, within the venue. So it will look different in different places. And we've been working with uh, uh, some of the larger venues to look at that. I think what I said was that you know, not to see large international gatherings this summer, but that we would have the opportunities to have festivals. And I do remember talking about music festivals and especially outdoor festivals. So I guess it's a definition of what large is. <laughs> so. Hello, Binder. I do. Um, and this is for you, Premier. Um, just wanted to ask you about have to ask you about this heat wave. Uh, we're now hearing that there could be possibly dozens of deaths that are attributed or factor in the heat wave as part of um, the death. And 
we also know in British Columbia there are a lot of places that don't have air conditioning, whether these are seniors' homes that we've heard from hospices saying that they are struggling. We know people have mobility issues and may not be able to get to a cooling centre. Some may not have heard about cooling centres. So I'm wondering if there's more that the province could have done to help the people of British Columbia during this time. Uh, should there have been a provincial coordinated response like we see for wildfires or flooding? Well, that's a very good question, and uh, we have, of course, uh, the coroner uh, will be issuing a report later in the day about uh, unexpected deaths over the past, I believe, 48 hours. Uh, she will be, as she always does, investigating those fatalities and reporting out to the public uh, directly. Uh, my concern uh, going into the weekend, seeing uh, the forecasts of uh, the record-breaking uh, heat in British Columbia and places that have not experienced that uh, here in Victoria, for example, you're on an island in the Pacific Ocean. You don't expect to uh, be hovering around uh, 40 degrees. Uh, Port Alberni, Kamloops, uh, Lytton, of course, setting a, a record. Uh, we have tried, uh, and our cities, uh, usually those that are accustomed to heat like this, have municipal uh, pro programs in place to protect people, uh, calling on them to come to cooling centres, uh, ensuring that we're checking up on uh, the people we care about and the people that we know uh, may well be in distress. Uh, obviously, we can always, uh, in hindsight, uh, have planned to do better and do more. Uh, in this instance, I think the, the, the big lesson coming out of, of the past number of days is that the climate crisis is not a fiction, it is absolutely real. And if you look, I've had a briefing from the wildfire service uh, yesterday and again today, the entire west coast of North America from Baja to Alaska is uh, red hot and uh, awaiting what could be another catastrophic fire season just ahead of us as lightning starts to come into the equation. So uh, are we in a, a, a difficult patch as a province and as a, as a region? Absolutely. Uh, but these are longer term challenges and that's why our Clean BC plan and ensuring that Canada continues to demonstrate leadership internationally. This is not a British Columbia problem, it's not a Canada problem, it is a global challenge and we all need to have citizens of the world coming together as we have quite frankly to address a global pandemic. We now have to redouble our efforts to address uh, global warming and the consequences on, on people, on, on communities and on the landscape. And most importantly, I think on the landscape, as we've seen, uh, should we end up having a, another difficult fire season, that will be three out of four of the seasons that I've been premier have been record breaking. And uh, no one can plan for three out of four years being the worst ever. Uh, with respect to how we keep people safe, uh, there are a range of issues. Uh, keep the blinds closed. Have that, that cold cloth in, in the fridge to, to make sure that you're, you're uh, cooling yourself down. Hydrate. Uh, Dr. Henry and Minister Dixon and I were talking before we came down about the steps that people need to take. Uh, we are hopeful that those, st those uh, hints are getting out to people, those directives are getting out to people. Uh, we could have done a better job, but I think there's a saturation point uh, with many people, we have been talking about COVID-19, we've been talking about opioids, we've been talking about climate. Uh, and when the heat hits, uh, the public goes to the coolest place they can. And what we need to do is remind each other that we are in a community. And if we are feeling well and able, we should check on those that may not be. Going back to the phone lines, Lisa Houston, News 1130. Premier, just to follow up on that a bit, no, we didn't know, you know, we haven't experienced this kind of heat before, but I'm talking to scientists who say that their forecasting was accurate. And as of last Wednesday, knew that this kind of outrageous heat was coming. And, you know, like people from warm climates and cold places, they don't quite get how dangerous it can be. And so why did the province not do more to ensure that the message was getting out? The scientists I talked to talked about in France how this has happened, and they saw hundreds of people die why the message wasn't given by the province better to say this, you know, you've made it through COVID, but this could take your life. Because I don't think enough people got it. We're seeing that with the number of deaths. Well, again, I'll, I'll await the uh, coroner's uh, determination. Uh, as Dr. Henry said, uh, 
fatalities are part of life uh, and uh, the consequences or the, or the causes of those fatalities are examined by officials that uh, we put in place as a society uh, to make sure we're getting the best information possible so that we can put in place programs and policies to protect people going forward. And uh, again, this was uh, an unprecedented heat wave, uh, records uh, broken day after day. Uh, the public was acutely aware that we had a heat problem uh, and we were doing our best to break through all of the other noise to encourage people to take steps to protect themselves. Uh, but it was uh, apparent to anyone who walked outdoors that we were in an unprecedented heat wave. And again, there's a, a level of personal responsibility. I'm not ducking the issue uh, at all, Lisa. This is, uh, this is a tragedy upon a ho host of others that we've had to address over the past number of months. But um, uh, I believe we did what we could to get information out. And, and we rely also on uh, the public press and media outlets who've done a really good job, in my mind, of making the case, uh, weather forecasters on uh, all of the uh, networks, on radio, uh, were making the case, uh, telling people to be wary, and uh, we have our presence, our internet presence and social media doing that as well. Uh, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not dodging the issue, but uh, again, you can prepare for a whole bunch of things, but if you don't have air conditioning, which uh, certainly I don't in my, my home, uh, you can't do much about it other than find other alternatives. And I will also say, though, that uh, one of the, the uh, advantages of COVID is that that allowed us to make significant investments in uh, air conditioning and, and HVAC systems within our public school system. Minister Dix is uh, recreating our long-term care uh, capacity across the province, which will involve uh, new facilities, upgrading existing facilities. Uh, these are, are, are longer term projects, but uh, made more important now than ever before because of COVID and because uh, we now uh, are absolutely clear that climate change is affecting us in ways that uh, we hadn't yet imagined. This is, as I say, another uh, horrific year of heat that we're not accustomed to in a temperate rainforest. Follow up, Lisa. Yes, and this one may be for Dr. Henry. With all the changes that are coming uh, regarding lifting restrictions for the pet from the pandemic, how quickly can changes be made again if we have to, I hate the word pivot, but pivot like the UK and Israel has had to do? And do you expect that that may happen anytime this summer or is it most likely to happen when, you know, cold and flu season starts again in the fall? I, um, I want to start by just adding one other thing to what uh, the last question you asked the Premier in, in that uh, from the health perspective, um, we have had a, a heat health alert plan in the province, particularly in those areas where we tend to see heat um, heat waves come uh, periodically, so the lower mainland and some parts of the interior. But they are relevant and we uh, monitor these impacts across the province and all of the health authorities uh, implemented uh, heat alerts and worked with their local municipalities on Friday um, to make sure that we had cooling centers open and that we were um, putting the message out to people about the things they needed to take, uh, the measures we needed to take to keep safe. There's a lot of information on the BCCDC website that's been put out um, with uh, Dr. Sarah Henderson and Tom Kozatsky and our team at BCCDC. And I know my colleagues across the province in public health have been working with municipalities to make sure that we have uh, places where people can go and systems to check in on people who are at risk um, from heat. So those are some of the things that uh, we started on on Friday when I was up in, uh, in Kelowna working with the team there. Um, just uh, in in terms of yeah I you know we look at the situation that we have here I, with our data um, the people that we have immunized the age ranges of our of people who have been immunized where we're seeing transmission and then we look at both Israel and the UK there's a lot of transmission that's happening in pockets of of mostly younger people who are not immunized and so this is um, <laughs> my plea is that yes we need to continue to build up our protection through immunization. 
But what we have seen, and we showed that yesterday, is our, our cases are coming down no matter what strain of the virus people are infected with. And that's because we're taking those measures to stop transmission and because it can't take off because of those barriers of protection that we have through immunization. So we absolutely need to keep pushing, particularly in those pockets in some communities in the interior and in those age groups where we started to see leveling off. So it is important that we keep up our immunization, but we need to balance that with the other parts of our lives that are causing um, harms and effects on people as well, and that is the social interactions. And I don't expect that we're going to see it in the short term, um, but yes, we need to uh, be mindful of that. And there are a lot of unknowns as we go into the fall. So that is where we're um, focusing on. That's why we're saying we need to take this slowly, but also we need to have those basic principles in place so that as we go into the fall, if we start to see increased transmission, um, we're able to, to actively manage it. Um, I don't expect it's going to spread widely because so many people have been immunized, but it will um, unlikely affect uh, businesses or school or a long-term care home or a certain community. And we need to be able to manage that. And that may mean going back to, to certain things like staying home for a period of time or wearing masks in certain situations um, come the fall. Coming back to the room, Richard Zussman, Global News. We heard a lot of concerns when the mask mandate wasn't in place yet around uh, people who would not listen to guidance. When stores posted signs saying it's recommended and people refused to because they said it's not against the law. What should a business do now if someone refuses to put on a mask when it's only recommended? Yeah, I think I'll ask Minister Callon to talk to this because these are some of the discussions we've had. And, you know, I think we've come a long way since then, too. People have recognized the importance of the things that we do to protect ourselves and others. And uh, we've come uh, to accept and understand where masks are, are used. And I think there's a comfort level now that may not have been there at that period of time. Um, but, uh, yes. We are going to be working with businesses to make sure that we can do this in ways that um, are respectful and safe for workers in particular. And that is that is the thing. And there's some businesses, I mean, look at healthcare, where mask wearing is part of our um, requirements on a day-to-day -day basis, and that won't change either. Um, so I, I, there are, I ask people to support businesses to protect their workers and to um, live up to the requirements that they have. Yeah, so we uh, we were, uh, when we started to put the plan together, the restart plan, uh, one of the things that was clear from the business community that we wanted certainty in the restart plan. And, and so we, seven weeks ago, over seven weeks ago, we were able to provide them the restart plan that shows them clearly that in step three, when we get to step three, which is today, that uh, the mask um, mandatory would go to recommendation. So uh, we have provided uh, a lot of, uh, uh, um, advance notice for businesses to prepare for this. But as I made a comment earlier, this will be a challenge still for businesses. And so we're asking for people to be patient and respect the rules of the local business. Uh, we had some businesses who had challenges even when it was mandatory where people didn't want to follow the rules. Uh, and, uh, and certainly the conversations we've been having with our industry engagement table about the next steps is that there will be some challenges. Uh, every business will decide what they want to do uh, how much comfort that their uh, patrons would like and how much comfort that they have uh, on their steps forward. But overall, overall, we've been getting a positive response of where we go. And in the next few days, we've continued to, uh, we're going to continue to engage with businesses on what challenges may arise uh, as we proceed. Richard, follow up. This is on the heat. So for either Minister Dix or Premier Horgan, there's been a lot of criticism about how BC Emergency Health Services has handled the heat over the last few days. Uh, will anybody be held responsible here for what happened? We're going to get this coroner's report. Will somebody be held responsible for deaths that we've seen linked to the heat? And does there need to be an extension of a state of emergency in some semblances to manage the heat as it sort of cools in the lower mainland but will continue in many other parts of the province? Um, first of all, uh, each health authority has their 
an emergency plan related to the heat and has had that in place uh, since Friday actively. We have emergencies operations centers for it because there is an expectation of challenges. And it's not just BC Emergency Health Services. It's our home support networks because by definition, people who receive public home support have underlying uh, health vulnerabilities. It's long-term care. It's acute care. And you've seen this in operation. One of the public ways it was done, of course, was the shifting of staff and the decision to cancel some immunization clinics on the weekend. So we saw some of that. Um, we received uh, in the last uh, uh, 24 hours yesterday a record number of ambulance calls on Saturday. That broke the record on Saturday and on Friday, 1,950. And I think that our ambulance paramedics have responded to that as they always do with extraordinary effort and bravery under the circumstances. It is a very challenging time. It's why Minister Mike Farnworth put out the information that he did to the general public and it's why we've been responding. Just to give you an example, 2,200 uh, emergency rooms visits in the Fraser Health Authority when we typically get 1,600 has mean, meant a plan to reallocate staff to support emergency rooms, including allowing ambulance paramedics to leave more quickly because they're getting off to other calls and not be stuck in emergency rooms. So in every part of our health care system, emergency rooms, acute care services, uh, uh, long-term care, of course, home support and in the community, there's a response. And then there is the reality of this heat day after day, which affects us as human beings profoundly, especially those of us with underlying health conditions. And we have to do everything we can to support each other in these times, even over the next few days when, as you say, the heat in some communities may lessen, not in all, but where we have the cumulative effect of day after day of this. So that means that we have to support one another. Sometimes that means not just phoning, but visiting. All of the steps Dr. Henry has spoken about, that we've, all the information that's been put out publicly. But I think with respect to our uh, healthcare system, and what we have to do with BC Emergency Health Services is to uh, continue. And I believe on July 2nd, we're posting yet more hundreds of new positions, new full-time positions in BC Emergency Health Services. We've had record increases in recent years. And the reason why is we need to transform our, our ambulance system into what the, the demands of this, of uh, the 21st century, because it was very much in structure prior to that based on a model that no longer was relevant. And I think we've been doing that. But every ambulance si system is going to be tested by this kind of record day. It is profound and, uh, and challenging. It's why calls are triaged and it puts pressure on our dispatchers, it puts pressure on our ambulance paramedics. And I think, um, as I say, they respond to it. And it's being done, of course, in the context of uh, the COVID-19 public health emergency over the last few days and the overdose public health emergency, which has particularly affected those systems. So we have to continue to do what we've been doing, which is uh, adding hundreds of full-time ambulance paramedics positions, but also providing other supports in communities uh, so that our public health care system can do a better job supporting people in these times. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, I think I know people are working flat out, and it feels like working flat out after a year and a half of working flat out after, in, in the case of the overdose public health emergency, uh, you know, five years of working flat out. So this is the challenge we face. I think I said we talked about it yesterday, but we also talked about it in early June, that um, this period with uh, the reduction in COVID cases and COVID transmission is going to be a real challenge for uh, our health care system because our system is it has been stressed over time by what has been, in our lifetimes anyway, an unprecedented uh, pandemic in our, that's affected every one of our communities. And now, of course, uh, there are all the other things that happen in a daily, uh, on a daily basis that challenge us. But I, I think our, our ambulance paramedics have, uh, are, as always, responding to it well, and we have to continue uh, to support them by adding resources again and again and again, and that's what we intend to do. Next. Next question is from Moira Whiten, Atai. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Premier Horgan, I just want to come back to what you said earlier. You called uh, BC's results during the pandemic extraordinary uh, compared to other regions in Canada. Is it fair to say that, given um, the report on excess deaths that just came out today? I know Dr. Henry addressed it, but you know, c can we really call just under 2,000 and potentially hundreds more deaths uh, an extraordinary result? Uh, well, uh, the data, uh, putting aside uh, the report that Dr. Henry uh, spoke, spoke to, the data is overwhelmingly uh, supportive of that position. The fatalities, uh, which was our objective when Dr. Henry and Minister Dix first uh, uh, briefed me back in January of last year, our objective was to keep as many British Columbians safe and alive as possible. And as regrettable as it is uh, and tragic for families to have had 1750 plus uh, people uh, pass away, uh, over 11,000 in Quebec, uh, the next closest of the jurisdictions of our size of 5 million people in North America, the next closest to uh, the low mortality rate is Ontario and their mortality rate is twice what ours is. So I think it is a fair statement to make. And I know that um, it's undeniable that as uh, Minister Dix just said, our already stretched health care system because of the opioid crisis, because of the other challenges that we inherited when we came to government, uh, has done extraordinarily well because of the people, not because of government policy, not because of anything I or, or Minister Dix did, but because we had a public health office uh, uh, staffed by Dr. Henry and an extraordinary team that went to work immediately to protect British Columbians. I'm very proud of the work they did and uh, it is uh, undeniably a, a a superior outcome to other jurisdictions in Canada. Moira, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. Um, this one's from Minister Dix. Minister, um, there have been uh, a lot of reports, and per sorry, perhaps also to Dr. Henry, there have been a lot of reports of um, people who visits with their loved ones are not being honoured um, uh, in, in long-term care, not being able to get in for their um, allotted number of, uh, of hours, of time, etc. Why haven't we heard anything about long-term care restrictions being lifted under stage three? And, and why are we not, why are loved ones not able to go see uh, their family and their friends in long-term care homes now that, you know, we're having large gatherings and, and limited restrictions, if any, in, in businesses in the province? Well, well first of all, I, I have family in long-term care and we do visit. So, uh, and it's because uh, of significant changes that were made March 25th which were to expand visitation and long-term care. At a moment, you'll recall when we were introducing the circuit breaker changes to try and reduce uh, community transmission. And uh, the f impact, of course, on long-term care of vaccination has been profound. If you look at 49 outbreaks on January 15th and the, the vaccination of both workers and of, uh, and of residents in long-term care had an almost immediate, within weeks, uh, reduction in that, and that led to uh, a lower level of mortality in the third wave. With respect to visitation and long-term care, there are more changes that um, are uh, needed and will be made. And like I say, they're not, they're not coincident with uh, this, uh, this multi-step process we've put in place in terms of the easing of restrictions broadly. But they haven't been all along. We've uh, acted in long-term care to massively invest in staff and we raised care standards significantly. That's happened. To support long-term care efforts, the investment in infection control, the single site order, which led, led to wage leveling and an improvement in the, uh, in the uh, working conditions of long-term care workers, and all of the other measures that have been put in place. And still, there have been, of course, um, en enormous challenges in long-term care, uh, in spite of what I think has been by national standards, uh, a very strong response by public health. So with respect to visitations, you, you should expect to see even more steps um, in the coming uh, days, and uh, those are being reviewed right now. But they're not, uh, they're not in sync just as we lessen or we increase visitation just as we are introducing new restrictions. We're, we're moving those, uh, we'll be putting those into place, uh, working uh, with uh, long-term care residents, their families, and uh, long-term care homes, and you should expect those uh, uh, very soon. We have time for one more question today. Tanya Fletcher, CBC. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate on the new ways, as you put it, that people are going to be informed about developments in the pandemic uh, now that the briefings are ended. Um, is there a plan for regular press releases or occasional briefings if the situation warrants it? And along those lines, um, Minister Dix, you said that appropriate information uh, will be shared with media every week going forward. Does that mean we won't be getting the number of new cases, active cases, hospitalizations, deaths, uh, every day uh, going uh, forward as of next week? And, and if not, why is that no longer important? Uh, to toute la politique est locale. Hein? The, um, um, the, I, I would say this, that you're going to be receiving information every day. Uh, the information on case counts, the information on mortality, the information on hospitalizations. And there'll be, uh, you'll receive that in a new form. That's all, not in the form of a statement, but in the form probably of an information bulletin. So you're going to get it, uh, the information that you need, the information you've been getting uh, uh, on a regular daily basis. What you're not, we're not going to have are the regular briefings, although obviously, um, uh, I don't know about Dr. Henry, but I'm not taking any time off anytime soon. Uh, so you'll uh, you'll obviously be able to ask us uh, questions. I suspect there is the largest immunization program in BC history that we're in the midst of, and we're going to continue to inform about all of these questions. You're going to have access to the dashboard, ask access to uh, information, uh, um, possibly even before three o'clock, because. Uh, uh, but uh, at, what, uh, at some hour of the day on a regular basis so that you'll have that information. We're just changing the format of that um, uh, given the circumstances, but will obviously be available when needed uh, uh, to you, um, to you, Tanya, and to all your colleagues. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. And uh, one last time, because you know it's coming, if we could get an answer in French as well for my colleagues, thank you. Um, now that we're replacing many public health orders with guidance, um, what is WorkSafe BC's role? Uh, with removing on limits, uh, re removing limits on indoor uh, group dining, for example, mingling between tables still won't be allowed. Um, but are you confident that will be properly monitored and enforced still? Yeah, so we've uh, we've had a really great uh, uh, group working with uh, with WorkSafe. We've had our workplace safety team, and uh, so there's a shared responsibility between the WorkSafe prevention officers and environmental health officers and others who actually uh, um, from the licensing uh, branch as well. So. We have now um, some processes in place, and yes, there's still fines, there's still other things that can be used, but we know as well that we've worked really closely with uh, the many different sectors over this long period of time, and uh, we know that uh, restaurants and bars and pubs, they want to increase people's um, uh, confidence in coming back, and so I encourage people to do that, to do it safely, and uh, we think that that's going to work well, and work safe will still be there to support the workers, uh, public health will still be there to make sure that we can um, help um, manage any issues that arise and do the inspections as well. And uh, we still have the ability to fine if need be through the, uh, the orders under the Emergency Program Act. Dr. Henry va travailler sur son français pendant l'été, sans doute. Mais, mais euh, euh, je dirais euh, que WorkSafe BC va continuer à faire euh, le travail nécessaire pour protéger euh, euh, la santé des, des travailleurs un peu partout dans la province. Le, le rôle principal pour, euh, pour euh, exprimer et pour euh, appliquer les lois de la santé publique sans des gens qui travaillent pour la santé publique dans toutes les euh, régions de santé et ça va continuer. Donc, euh, il, il va falloir continuer à faire un grand effort euh, de, de, de nous assurer euh, que des gens restent euh, protégés. Et il y a un rôle pour WorkSafe, bien entendu, mais il y a, il y a aussi euh, un rôle principal pour la santé publique et pour les effectifs de la santé publique. Et ça va continuer. Et avec, euh, et avec ça, je pense que euh, je pense qu'on va terminer euh, cette conférence de presse. Euh, Est-ce que peut-être... Euh, eh bien, non. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, and uh, and have a very uh, have a safer day. 
as possible today. And uh, perhaps the Premier, you'd like to? No? He's good. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Take care.